This is Dylan, enjoying a holiday in January 2020. Just a month later, his family caught COVID. For seven-year-old Dylan, it was the start of long-term illness. I'm having a heart pains. A headache. About six weeks later, he just presented really, really ill. He would just lie down on the floor. He wouldn't stand up. He felt continuously nauseous. The vomiting would happen more at night. Um, he would have heart pains, involuntary shaking. Dylan was unwell for 15 months, but gradually started to feel better in May last year. Unfortunately, COVID hit us the second time on the 9th of September. At the time, Dylan wasn't very sick, but six weeks later, Dylan started to go down severely ill, um, would be vomiting constantly throughout the day um, to the point where school, he could no longer go to school. Everything's back, achy bones, headaches, stomach aches, tiredness. Dropping the legal duty to test or isolate could have a huge impact on Dylan. At least we are starting to get, again, a good day. But he then says to me, you know, what if he gets it again? It absolutely makes me so nervous to send him to school knowing that he's got a high chance that there could be someone in the class who's got COVID, who may be in mild symptoms, but my son's going to be really sick. And we've got no, no support. There's no uh, ventilation. There's nothing, there's no protective rules being put into classrooms as we speak. What we are seeing is that children who are getting reinfected are getting symptom flares, symptom triggers. And of course, we don't know what that's going to do to their long-term health um, and their immune system. 1.3 million people in the UK are living with long COVID, including 117,000 children. And there's currently no treatment. And once we stop free testing, how many people are going to get long COVID? And what does that mean? What does that mean for the workforce? How many people will still be sick in, in six months, in a year? How is the workforce going to be in, impacted with the cumulative effect of all these people getting long COVID? Free testing comes to an end next week. Two years on from his first infection, Dylan has become unwell again. Even though restrictions have now been lifted for anyone living with long COVID, the worries about reinfection have not. Nicola Hazler, BBC Look East. Dr Lucy Cheek from the University of Cambridge led the study on the brain effects of long COVID in adults. She told me it is clear it affects our memory, but they won't know if the problem is permanent until they know what causes it. If it's the case that something happened that caused damage, you know, so permanent scarring, for example, then that's much less likely to get better kind of quickly and steadily than something that is an, something like an ongoing inflammation. So one of the really important questions we're trying to address is what's causing this precisely and whether or not there are treatments either to prevent it happening in new infections or hopefully to be able to treat people who already have this problem. It could have implications for people's jobs, this, couldn't it? Because if you are in a job where memory is a really key factor, how do you carry on? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really what we get reported from the patients that take part. In our study, about half of the people with long COVID and 75% of those with severe ongoing symptoms reported having to take long periods away from work. And previous studies have shown that when people do have problems with work, it's generally the cognitive issues that really drive that. And it can be a really huge problem, especially if we think about the number of people likely to be suffering from this in the future. If the ONS estimates of around 10 to 25% of COVID infections translating into long COVID continue to be true post Omicron and vaccination and so forth, then that would be a substantial portion of the population really struggling with kind of basic being able to basic abilities of being able to cope cognitively with everyday life and that's a real worry we're just at the very start of this aren't we you know listening to what you're saying we've been dealing for the past two years on a day-to-day -day basis with how do we protect ourselves from this virus but we're only just scratching the surface of what the long-term implications might be aren't we 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's the real concern, especially with all of the restrictions and the mitigations being lifted. We don't know what the long term implications are. And basically, every time new information comes out, it's more concerning. We know from previous viruses that many viral infections can have very long term issues that are that result from them. And it seems short sighted only two years in to start saying, oh, well, now that fewer people are dying because we have the vaccinations, we can just let this infection run rife. The long term implications may be far more serious in the long term than they have been over the last couple of years. And of course, it's not just adults who get long COVID, is it? It's it's children, too, um, which your study hasn't touched on as yet. Is there a plan for that? Yes. So we have two new studies running at the moment. The first is a follow up of the adults um, asking new questions and especially exploring what the impact of vaccination is. The second one is looking at children aged four to 12, partly because of this um, narrative that COVID doesn't hurt children. It does. And long COVID is an issue within children and it really desperately needs to be studied. So that's another thing we're looking into with some urgency. That's Dr Lucy Cheek. Well, if you're suffering from long COVID, you can take part in the next round of Dr Cheek's research. They're looking for adults of any age, any gender and also children aged between four and 12, as you heard there. So if you are interested, drop us an email. We'll be able to put you in touch. Our details, there they are on the screen for you now.